Can you give us a quick summary of uh, that visual history? Um, yeah, I can say some words about that. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be a, a com comprehensive overview. But um, at BB, we do a lot of uh, products that use AI. And as part of that work, we think a lot about how we're creating narratives, how we're visualizing this emerging technology. So part of the research work that we've done sort of adjacent to that is kind of trying to trace the narrative heritage of the framework that we use now. So how did we get to the stories that we're using now? How did we get to this kind of feeling of opposition, this kind of feeling of existential threats? Um, so me and my colleague, Iris Kupin, we looked you know, all the way back to sort of Greek mythology, stories of golems, stories of Frankensteins, of course. And we found sort of two themes that we come back to over and over again, which is first, that we will be overtaken by these automatons that we create. Um, and second, that we'll do so in spite of ourselves. Um, so if we think about the um, stories where we're being overtaken, you can think back to the first time the word robot was ever used, which was in a play in 1921 by a Czech playwright called Karl uh, Čepek. And the term came from the Czech word robota, which means forced labor or drudgery. And in the play, an eccentric scientist invents a robot the nephew thinks, great, I can make a ton of money off of this and build a robot empire. The ro robots take over um, all of humanity, and the only person who survives is someone who knows how to work with their hands. So this is a story we were already telling in the 1920s and well before that, and a story that carries on into Hollywood, into the stories that we're telling today. And sort of parallel to that are all these sort of man versus or person versus themselves kind of stories of, you know, we can't help but opening Pandora's box, we can't help but fly too close to the sun, we can't help but unleash the beast. Um, and so these are sort of all the narratives that AI comes preloaded with. Um, and yes, we looked at the visual history, but we were maybe more focused on the metaphorical and narrative history. And we see that even culminate in the use of the term artificial intelligence itself, which was um, sort of uh, um, officialized in 1956. Um, at the Dartmouth Summer Research Project, where they were trying to figure out what are we going to name this area of emerging technology. And artificial intelligence, like that term itself, already sort of poses a threat, already puts us in opposition. Um, and even at that, uh, in that space, there were people who opposed that term. They thought, like, this isn't going to set us up very well. And instead, other terms were thrown around, like complex information processing. Um, so it's sort of all of these different threads that have come together to... Um, yeah, position us now as in opposition and threatened by technology. Um, and that's something that we try to challenge uh, in our work. Amazing. That's about, yeah, 200 years of history. Actually, Greek <laughs> mythology in there as well. Yeah. So that's very impressive in two and a half minutes. <laughs> yeah. um, Gabby, maybe let's bring this up to speed. I guess that's the kind of the big context, the historical context here. I guess bringing this a bit closer to the modern day and thinking about AI, how would you describe the way that AI has been visualized, say, in the last decade or two? And uh, yeah, what visual tropes are we seeing a lot of? So I think um, some, of the, some of the visualizations that we're really common with are things like shiny white robots and blue glowing brains and neural networks with like, modes on it. Lots of sci-fi, like so to Amelie's point, lots of scary sci-fi, lots of uh, very futuristic representations. And these are problematic for a couple of reasons. Like one, they're, they're cliched, um, and from a design perspective, often not very nice. But also, um, some amazing work has been done by institutions like the Better Images of AI to show how these representations are feeding into some of the things that Amelie was talking about, some of these, these feelings of being in opposition to AI, some of these feelings of... Uh, uh, of um, disguising like, the real risks and rewards of the technology, setting AI as something as futuristic and far-flung as opposed to something which is part of our everyday and part of our reality. Okay, and I guess um, it's kind of one of the fundamental reasons why the Visualizing AI kind of project was set up, which I mentioned in the introduction. Um, can you tell us about that project, I guess, why it was set up and what you're aiming to achieve with that at Google DeepMind? I can try and do it without rambling about it. It's like it's, uh, I stop me from going on too long with this. I'll try and be succinct. Um, so yeah, the, the Visualizing AI project was set up to meet the needs of this problem of visual communication about AI. Like, like selfishly, like within our team, I work within the creative and marketing team at DeepMind, and um, we are constantly trying to like explain better the, tech, the complex technology that we we are creating. 
And we definitely found when we were trying to uh, find like stock imagery or trying to draw on visualizations that already existed, that it just felt very disparate and like from, from the work that we were doing, the technology that we knew that we were building. And so I think the project is an initiative to partner with a diverse range of artists and creatives and people like Amelie and Alexa and also Buck uh, to uh, redefine and like, create a more nuanced and accessible visual language for AI. I think there's like three key things about the project. One is that we position the creatives as the experts. So we try and give them the information about the subject matter that they're representing. So we pair them up with subject matter experts at DeepMind, so researchers, ethic, ethicists, engineers, people who know their, their subject matter inside out, um, in order to make sure that those representations are coming from a place of accuracy. Um, the second is that we try and enable full creative freedom. So beyond the initial brief, we allow the artists to go away and to represent the technology the way that they see it, because it's important to create a diversity of representation that people can come at, at this with like individual interpretations of, of, the, of the tech. And lastly, we open source everything. So um, it's crucial for us that if we are trying to create a different vernacular to talk about AI, that it is accessible to the widest range of people so that they can both use it and that they can also see it as inspiration or challenge it and, and feel that something else should be used instead. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I mean, we are going to come on to talking about, um, Alexa obviously did a commission for, for Google DeepMind, which we'll talk about. Um, but Michelle, you and the team at Buck have obviously worked on a lot of projects uh, involving AI and in the field of AI. I'd love to just step back just one second before we go into the kind of commissioning side of things and ask just like, why is this an important question, I guess? Like when it comes to creating this new visual language around AI, what's the potential benefit and what's really at stake? As Amelie and Gabby touched on, we already have this rich visual history of trying to understand um, AI technology, trying to understand machine learning. But I think what's interesting about this particular moment is it is really starting to become ubiquitous in our daily lives. So as designers, you know, we're seeing these new tools that are helping us with image making, with animation, with sound and music, but it's also entering all spheres of our lives. So it's like in your email, when you're communicating, as you're traveling, in your cars, even like coming up with recipes or watching movies, it's really touching everything. And so when investigating that underlying technology and trying to take these really complex concepts and then translating that into something that is immediately relatable to people, it's really important that the metaphors, for example, don't set up inherent power dynamics, where if we always have the human and it feels like AI technology is an augment uh, without which we will not be powerful, like that is problematic or it, there's implications there. Whereas if we set up visual metaphors where individuality and individual contribution or create, our creativity that we're bringing to it is impl implicitly always related to the final product, um, that's really important because it ties into the metaphors that help us tell the myths around the technology that we tell each other, we retell each other, we retell each other. So what is kind of emphasized and included versus what is minimized is really important as we pick these visual metaphors. 